Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mutual Exchange Radio. This is Alex McHugh. I'm filling in for usual host Zachary Woodman, and I'm joined today by C4SS Editing Coordinator Evan Pierce. Evan is a gardener, builder, and anarchist working on generating and regenerating universal ecological infrastructure. They're into the cross-pollination of ideas and the intersections of praxis between anarchism, permaculture, and transhumanism. So Evan also serves as our editing coordinator at C4SS, and I wanted to talk to Evan this month in part because we've been meaning to have them on for a while, uh, but also because this seemed like a really great time uh, to talk about ecology and anarchism. Anarchists often get accused, market anarchists especially, of not really caring about issues like climate change, uh, resource scarcity, and general ecological stewardship. But Evan's here to hopefully dispel that rumor um, and talk about how ecology can fit neatly into the mission of market anarchism. So Evan, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's It was really great to have you on the last Outgroup episode. Um, and I'm excited to dig deeper into your thoughts on ecology, on, an, on anarchism, on transhumanism, you know, whatever else we get into here. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I, I had a lot of fun on the Outgroup, and I'm glad to be here. Um, I also just wanted to say I really appreciate all your help and guidance in the process of me becoming the center's editing coordinator. I started out just kind of volunteering to do a little bit of proofreading. I've slowly grown into taking on more of the responsibilities around corresponding with writers, getting stuff published. And I'm just, C4SS has just some fantastic writers, and it's such a pleasure for me to be able to contribute in the small ways I can. And I just appreciate all the work you do, Alex, as the coordinating director and everything else. So thanks. Oh, geez. <laughs> you, you didn't have to say all that. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been really great to work with you and, you know, to have someone really grow into the, the editing coordinator position, which is what I did before, you know, before I was coordinating director. So yeah, it's been really cool to see the direction that you've taken things in the editing world and, you know, getting our op-eds up every week. Um, and even, you know, even finding time to write some of your own, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I, I'd like to do more writing. We'll see if I, I find the find the time. <laughs> yeah, that's always the you get into the other side of things and it uh starts to get tough to write your own pieces. But I wanted to start actually with your essay, um, Beyond UBI, sowing the seeds of universal ecological infrastructure. Um, because it's you know, it was a really great uh piece of writing and I want to delve into a bunch of other things later, but can we start with just like a quick summary of the argument you made in that piece? Sure. Um, yeah, I guess I, I start by saying that while I agree with the stated goals of universal basic income or UBI proponents, I don't oppose UBI in the abstract, I still think it's not ideal and that we as anarchists should strive for something better something more deeply radical and far-reaching. So I try to lay out a brief sketch of a vision of a world where the basic needs of both humans and non-humans alike are met via nearly effortless interactions with their immediate surrounding environment. Mm -hmm. So I go into some permaculture concepts a bit and sort of sketch out uh, like a theoretical basis for this. So I talk about things like food forests and passive homes. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and I, I try to take the idea of income from universal basic income and connect it to this idea within permaculture site design of sector analysis, which basically looks at the incoming energies that flow onto a site, what directions they come from, when and with what intensity. Um, and energies are broadly understood here as all kinds of things like sunlight and shade, wind, rain, how water flows above and below ground, even things like views, noise, hazards like pollution or potential fire. Um, and then permaculture sector analysis attempts to observe and consider all these incoming streams and attempts to orient the components of a site in relation to each other to block or redirect undesirable energies and to capture and store desirable energies. And of course, things might be desirable in some contexts or for certain elements, but not for others. Mm. Um, yeah, no, that, that's interesting. Um, I do like the way in which it kind of takes a further step back, right? Like. My understanding of UBI is that that's what happened with the development of UBI in answer to our current sort of welfare system is like, okay, let's take a step back and what is the most fundamental thing that people need? And the answer was just 
cash. And so you're taking a step even further and saying, well, no, it's not cash. <laughs> it's many of the things that we, you know, often use cash to get, right? But it's, you know, down to the, the sunlight and the sh shade and the wind and the rain and all those things you just listed are the things that actually keep us alive, right? Yeah, I mean, I think we could imagine a situation where we where we have plenty of cash, but nobody accepts it for what we actually need, potentially. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's not, maybe that is hard to imagine, but. Or, or even seems... worse, right? Like we have, we have tons of cash, but the, like there is no more sunlight or there, you know, there is no more clean air, uh, right? Right. Yeah. Like that's going to do us very little good. Yeah. Yeah. So I try to, try to ground the, uh, the discussion a little bit in some of the physical realities that we have to deal with. Mm. Yeah. And so can you talk a little bit more about analyzing flows? You know, what kind of things you look at? Um, I know you mentioned rain maybe being an example. Um, yeah. So uh, rain might be desirable in some contexts, but not others. Like we, we probably don't want the insides of our homes and indoor spaces to get rained on. But we probably do want rainwater in our garden soil, so redirecting rain catchment from roofs seems like a pretty good idea. And yeah, of course, whether something is desirable or not will also depend on when it's arriving. Like you might want the warmth from the sunlight during the winter, but want shade during the summer, or you want the cooling winds during the summer, but want to block them during the winter. So there's a dimension of time here. Um, and there's a lot of information out there about passive design, uh, things like ground coupling or earth sheltering that uh, utilizes the stable temperatures found underground to moderate the conditions of structures, whether that's for heating or cooling. And there's stuff like passive cooling techniques that utilize evaporation and convective airflow, and passive solar heating techniques that directly absorb the heat from sunlight and store it in thermal mass that radiates it back out over time. Um, and the even simple things like using differences in a site's elevation to store the potential energy from gravity. Yeah, and, a, and a, a permaculture design principle that's worth keeping in mind that I think really ties together a lot of these techniques. It's kind of a dual principle of each element should support multiple functions and each function should be supported by multiple elements. So this is kind of a repudiation of the fragility of monopolies, yeah. as you could say. No, I really like that. And I, I think there's a real interesting analogy to technology and some of the conversations that are going on about peer-to-peer -peer technology, you know, mesh networks for Wi-Fi, and this idea of, of resilience, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, resilience meaning like being able to adapt to like shocks to a system or being able to um, resist like disruption. Yeah, so that's that's really cool. And I actually I'm interested specifically in this idea of storing sunlight in thermal. I know it's been an issue for a long time with solar panels that there's not a particularly great way to store that energy. Can you say a little bit more about what you're talking about here? Yeah, so solar panels are like photovoltaic panels. Um I guess you could call that kind of like active solar where it's taking it's taking the sunlight and turning it into electricity, and then we can use that for all kinds of things, and even including heat, though, that tends to be relatively inefficient. Um, you lose a lot of the energy in the process of going from electricity to heat and back, um, whereas passive solar design kind of uses the sunlight and that heat directly and stores it in the batteries that it uses, our, our, our actual mass, um, thermal mass, so things like earth like adobe or or stone or water is a really efficient thermal mass um and the idea is that when you are wanting to collect that sunlight you've got you know you're you're glazing your windows facing south in the northern hemisphere e towards the equator and mm -hmm. so in the winter the sun's low in the sky and you're getting lots of that solar energy is coming in and you're hopefully collecting it in thermal mass that then like stores it and so it doesn't overheat right away because you've got so much mass for it to heat up. And then once the sun goes down and you're going into the cold night, that mass has soaked up a bunch of heat and it can slowly radiate it back out into your space and keep you warm. It's, it's the basic basic principle anyway. And you want you want insulation. You want you want insulation outside of your 
outside your space, surrounding your space, surrounding your mass, so you don't lose all of that at night to the to the cold night sky. That is that is fascinating. So, I mean, if I understand correctly, it's basically the idea that by using particular materials in building a structure and in the windows and how you arrange them, you're you're just using all of that to capture the heat from the sun and have it naturally release when you need it. That's fascinating. Yeah, and and there's there's lots of ways to design and build structures that require zero or nearly zero energy to to keep them comfortable. Or to be more specific, these structures can be set up to passively harvest energy from their surrounding environment for free, so they don't require electricity from the grid or from fossil fuel generators. Maybe you only need a tiny amount of energy from things like roof-mounted photovoltaics or windmills to run things like automated shutters or fans or pumps. Um, yeah. Hmm. Well, I mean, I'm interested there. You know, there's a saying among libertarian economists about uh, things being free, right? So I, I like that you say, you know, zero or nearly zero energy. Um, but I'm wondering what kind of costs are involved. I would I would imagine that the trade off is in time and effort. Yeah, often there's there's maybe more of an initial investment. Um, you know, a lot of houses built these days probably don't have, um, there's not a lot of mass inside. You've got maybe, you know, stick frame construction and drywall and, you know, maybe you're, you've got, you're sitting on like a concrete slab or something, which is a fair amount of mass, but there's not usually like a big Adobe wall in the middle of your house or, or lots of water storage, for example. Um, so those things maybe cost a little more and there's a little more of upfront effort and, and other things that people might, why people don't, why aren't, why not? Other reasons why not all houses are built to be passive solar is maybe people want their windows facing the great view that they want to look at, or, or they are pointing the house towards the street instead of towards the equator. Mm. Um, so there's, there's a lot of like cultural, um, maybe, uh, pushback against some of these ideas or, or even just kind of, um, it, it isn't the it's not the first thought that people have it, when they think about where they want to put their windows. Right. Yeah, I, just, I I was getting so excited about it and started thinking, like, why would anyone ever be opposed? But it makes so much sense. Yeah. Most people don't want to live in such a constrained environment that's so focused on harvesting passive energy or doing all of these things. But I don't know. I guess what are. Um, what are what are some other things that we can learn from looking at the ecology around us, from understanding our world better and doing the sort of like sector analysis that you're talking about where, you know, we really get to know the resources um, that we interact with every day? Yeah, so we talked a little bit about um, shelter and also, so I guess food is a really important thing. So, and, and there's there's a lot of information out there about horticulture systems that, once they're set up, require very little ongoing maintenance to continue producing yields. So indigenous people from the Pacific Northwest to India to Amazonia have developed forest gardens where certain perennial species of trees, shrubs, vines, herbs, etc. are grown together in polycultures that complement and enhance each other's growth. So where niches that might otherwise be colonized by less desirable, opportunistic, dispersive species, we might call them weeds, are instead preemptively filled with desirable, edible, otherwise useful, or at least supportive species. So a common strategy within this would be like planting fast-growing nitrogen-fixing plants that are then chopped and dropped for mulch once the canopy fills in with your long-term succession of fruit and nut trees. Uh, the idea here is that with some foresight and some foresight and thoughtful design, we can grow largely self-maintaining ecosystems that produce food, fuel, fiber, medicine, many other useful goods and materials, and that provide valuable services like habitat for non-humans, air and water purification, long-term soil building and carbon sequestration, and that are just beautiful and refreshing places in which to live and spend time. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm familiar with the, um, I, I believe it was called like the three sisters, beans, corn, and squash. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that has to do with nitrogen content, right? Yeah, so the beans um, w- would be the nitrogen fixer, the leguminous uh, plant, that, and, and, and it grows up the, the corn. The corn kind of supports it. And then the squash spreads out and kind of shades the ground around it and keeps keeps the moisture down. And there's also a, a, a traditionally also a fourth sister, at least in the in the west, of Rocky Mountain bee plant that attracts pollinators. Oh nice. Um, okay. So you got the so whole yeah. the whole thing going, pollination included. Yeah, yeah. And so that's a kind of a classic guild. And there's a lot of those or a lot of polycultures and and there's a lot of um experiments being done. I mean you can you can you know, try to grow some plants together and see what, see how they do. And and there's a lot of information out there. I guess companion planting is like a kind of a keyword you can search for too, to find kind of what other people have done that, um, and how those might fit together. Nice. Yeah. So all of this is, is really fascinating. I feel like we've talked a lot about the specifics, right? And so you're advocating that instead of just thinking about UBI, we should also be thinking about all of this stuff, right? And so what's the what's the main argument for why? Like why are we taking a further step back? Yeah, I mean my argument is just that we should do more of this kind of thing. It's it's not the only thing that we should be doing. There's a lot of other really important things we have to do, but I think it's one piece that that is key that's important. Um, so, yeah, we should build homes that are as passive as possible. We should grow gardens that meet our needs with as little ongoing maintenance as possible. And we should do this everywhere. I mean, we're anarchists, so we've got big dreams. Our homes, our neighborhoods, our towns, our cities could all be vibrant, beautiful, diverse, interconnected, productive, passively comfortable ecosystems that meet the needs of their inhabitants nearly effortlessly. And so, you know, we, we can call this universal ecological infrastructure or UEI. And I'm just kind of playing on the idea of UBI and trying to draw some attention to these ideas. And I realize it's just like a made up buzzword or whatever. But, uh, but I think it, it addresses some of the same underlying issues as UBI and it rhymes with UBI. And that's just made up too, but it has some public appeal. So, yeah, I don't think it matters too much what we call it um, as long as we do it. So let's, but yeah, let's generate and regenerate universal ecological infrastructure. Nice. Yeah, I, I don't mind a good buzzword, and I do I do like the branding of like going off of UBI and talking about it in the same way. Um, and I also, I mean, I guess when anarchists talk about UBI, many of them probably imagine it to not be, you know, instituted by a government, but we'd find a different way of doing it. But what I love about this, um, you know, your focus on the ecological infrastructure is that there's no confusion of like the government should do this, right? Because it's talking about how we engage with our own, right, ecology around us and resources and on a community and individual level. So I don't know, I, just, I love that it also kind of sidesteps the whole government should do it part of, um, part of the conversation that I guess I often hear with UBI, right? Yeah, I think the government would be really bad at trying to implement this because it requires so much local knowledge and you have to like do so much observation um, from from your site and figure out what what's going to work specifically for your site. And so it's definitely not something that can be implemented top down or, you know, with the push of a button or signing of a check. It, it It's not going to work that way. Yeah. And I mean, as you were talking about earlier, the question of desire is also part of it, right? Like your desires around resource access are going to be different. Some people might not want their windows to face south and and all of that. Um, Yeah. And and what kind of, you know, fruit trees you want to grow? What what kind of food do you like to eat? That's what you should be planting. Like, right. The government might decide for you or that would suck. (laughs) I'm now thinking of that uh, Presidents of the U.S. song about eating lots of peaches. <laughs> yeah, they they come from a factory, a can <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's our that's our current system. You got to eat peaches from a can. <laughs> um, but okay, so all of this is very positive. I did notice a couple of like points of possible contention um, while rereading this essay. 
I think particularly for like the more libertarian side of our listenership, um, might take issue with the way in which you sort of downplay prices and means of exchange. Um, and so you say in the essay that an oft overlooked problem, even for those forms of UBI that don't rely on a state, is their reliance on a medium of exchange. Once you've received your basic income in the form of X number of food stamps or dollars or crypto coins, you still have to find someone willing to accept them in exchange for what you actually need to live, food, water, medicine, clothing, shelter, energy, etc. This you know, isn't nearly as precarious of a situation as directly relying on the state, at least to the extent that such resources are not monopolized, but it is still a step removed from having direct access to the basic things one needs to live. Essentially, I contend that universal basic income is neither universal enough nor basic enough. Its focus on monetary income is narrow and short-sighted. It is at least as fragile a program as the broader political economic system, and ultimately it doesn't address the roots of our total dependence on the physical landscape and its surrounding and underlying ecology. Um, so that was a, a pretty long quote, um, but I guess the main thing I'm wondering is how would this kind of concern for ecological infrastructure fit in with market systems? So like, where does the UEI end and market processes begin? Where do markets end and you know, direct access to resources begin? Um, and I guess, you know, just to make it interesting, so while we're talking on the economist side of things, is there an idea from ecology that you wish the more economically minded folks in market anarchism understood more? Um, so I can repeat those questions. I know I just said like a whole bunch of stuff. I'll try to, I'll do my best. Um, uh, yeah, I just, I want to first start making clear that I'm, I'm not someone who wants to abolish markets. Um, I see markets and prices as critically useful tools in navigating intersubjective values in the face of scarcity. And I'm solidly in the left-wing market anarchist camp as far as seeing the potential for truly freed markets to have centrifugal effects on wealth, to have counter-accumulative tendencies. Um, I also agree with left market anarchists to emphasize that the market is not some abstract force that exists above or outside of us. The market is us. We are, each of us, active sites of agency. We're not just affected by market processes. In many ways, we are market processes. Mm. And, and those market processes will, however imperfectly, generally optimize for and reflect the values of those participating. So as an anarchist, I obviously have opinions about what values people should hold. Things like, you know, consent, autonomy, ecological health, biological diversity, universal liberation. Um, and I'd argue that the anarchist project is largely about trying to get people to have better values. Um, truly freed markets, where pre-distribution of property titles are just and broadly egalitarian, and where anarchist values are the norm, seem to me like they'd be a great way of coordinating the highly diverse desires and associated needs of people with the available resources, and they generate the best possible outcomes compared to centrally planned approaches, which obviously mm. suffer from knowledge, power problems, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I'm realizing this is maybe a silly question because just like anything within actual anarchist context, it's very, it depends, right, on the context. <laughs> For sure. Um, yeah. And so my focus is just to, as much as possible, try to set things up so that everyone has direct access to the basic things they need to live without necessarily needing to interface with markets, per se. Mm -hmm. So where markets can be just like a fun, low stakes game, a way of seeking like higher pleasures and exploring various desires that require lots of coordination and cooperation between many different people as opposed to them being like a grueling slog that people are coerced by circumstances into participating in just to get what they need to survive. So while I agree with left market anarchists that many criticisms of markets tend to apply more so to the existing unfree markets of capitalism, I do sympathize with certain market skeptics around the point that not everyone enjoys or is necessarily proficient at navigating markets. Mm. For some people, the whole idea of going shopping can be pretty anxiety inducing, um, I guess, especially maybe these days with like the pandemic. Um, but being subject to like the capriciousness of a shopkeeper 
while it's obviously not going to be as bad, hopefully, as being subject to like a bureaucrat or a politician, because at least there's competition and incentives. Um, but it's that still seems less ideal to me than just being able to directly access what you need, whether you like 3D print it or pluck it from a tree growing right outside your door or, you know, your house just keeps you comfortable without ongoing inputs. Um, yeah. And I, I guess I anticipate that people will maybe say things like, well, that's a kind of market too, or but how are they going to get those fruit tree seeds or the 3D printers or the energy or materials to run them in the first place? And that's fine. I mean, again, I'm not trying to abolish markets. I recognize their utility and eventually creating a world where they're increasingly unnecessary for at least our basic survival. And I consider it possible and desirable to build and grow a world where everyone has direct access to an abundance of fresh air, water, food, and comfortable shelter. So I think it makes sense to aim for that. Yeah, so I really love, you know, what you're saying here, which is kind of in a way taking it back a step again, right? And I'm just thinking about how I always, you know, I always argue that the small business owner is better than being subject to a bureaucrat or a politician. And it's like, you've taken it even a step further to say like, yeah, but that's not perfect either. We can do even better. Um, and, you know, considering the fact that some small business owners are, you know, bigoted, ableist, otherwise make it difficult for people to get what they need. I just, this is brilliant, you know, and it's something, something I never would have thought of because I'm so focused on the like, okay, but a small business owner is better than some politician in D.C., um, and so, yeah, in terms of like insights from ecology, what is something that you wish more economists or economy minded folks knew about ecology? I, I want to kind of go back to that question. Um, that's a great question. And I confess that I, I really I don't know. I, I'm, I'm an amateur in both of those disciplines. I'm really probably not qualified to say, but I do think more just like integration of insights and cross pollination of ideas generally would probably be good. Um, I see what I see what you did there with the cross pollination. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, you know, I do see a lot of that. You know, there are some contentious points, but I also do see a lot of like analogies to economics and specifically the kind of like Austrian approach that talks about flows and resiliency. Um, and to me, it. it reading this essay, it sounded very similar to sort of Adam Smith's approach to economics, which is as you know, something that's fundament fundamentally human and related to our biological reality. Um, and so like this part of the essay really reminded me of that, where you say that uh, designing and cultivating resilient agroecological systems to provide habitats for a rich diversity of life while growing our own food, medicine, materials, etc., building and retrofitting our structures to be able to passively and efficiently shelter us, generating and regenerating the ecological infrastructure we need to live is the real action that we can take directly, autonomously, and gradually. We can start locally and grow together into a more global and universal movement. We need not ask permission from states or landlords, but we will need to organize resistance together and defend ourselves when they inevitably try to stop us. Um, so, yeah, I like that you're talking about flows and, you know, systems and understanding, you know, this very stigmergic way of building, right? Each individual doing their own thing sort of finds its way to come together. Um, but one thing I'm sort of wondering about here is if we're going to refocus on resources and on these flows of resources and on making those resilient, right? What do you think is the most fundamental of those resources? Or, um, you know, maybe to put it another way, what do you think is the most like pressing resource sustainability crisis right now? Where are those flows interrupted? Um, and yeah, what, what should we be looking at to try and fix in the, in the coming decades? We are surrounded by insurmountable opportunities. Um, <laughs> And that's a quote from, I think, maybe Bill Mollison, though, maybe other other folks have said that, too. And it might sound kind of cliche, but I would say that the most fundamental resource for humanity is our imagination. And I think it's both it's both our scarcest resource, and yet potentially our most abundant. And I want to quote from Mollison again. Um, 
Permaculture is information and imagination intensive. It is the quality of thought and the information we use that determines yield, not the size or quality of the site. Um, so what I, I would, what I think this is saying isn't that there aren't, that there's not physical limitations or material scarcities, but more often than not, it's how we end up approaching those that makes the biggest difference. So just some things that we consider problems are often or contain within themselves their own solutions if you have the relevant information. So the imperative to abolish all intellectual property, to abolish all monopolies on ideas becomes really clear here to me. Um, time, available energy, various resources are always going to be scarce, and we're going to have to economize on them in various ways. But the potentially infinite reproducibility at near zero marginal cost of ideas can enable us to utilize the best available information in our designs and strategies. So there's, there's really no excuse to intentionally generate more scarcity of this most critical resource of ideas when there already exists so much scarcity in the world we already have to strive to overcome. Mm. So I have nothing but disdain for folks who want to call themselves permaculturists but support the state enforcing like intellectual property laws. We of all people should know better. So, you know, abolish IP. And, and the abolition of borders and nations is key here, too especially as a changing climate causes the migration of plant and animal species, really entire ecosystems, polewards and towards higher elevations. The critical local knowledge about how to live with these species is intimately bound up with the people who have been co-inhabiting those ecosystems. Not to mention that it's obviously atrociously unethical to confine people to places where, you know, in, thanks in large part to states like the U.S. and their colonialism, resource extraction, imperial aggression and pollution, these places that are increasingly uninhabitable, whether it's due to desertification, rising temperatures, rising sea levels, or social instability or corruption. And I mean, even just people should just be able to move where they want for whatever reason. Um, so yeah, the free flow of ideas and the free movement and migration of people. These are, these are those critical flows, I would argue. Yeah, it's interesting. That's not really the answer I was expecting you to give, but it, it makes a lot of sense. And one thing I'm really worried about is the, you know, impending immigration crisis um, when desertification gets even worse and flooding gets even worse. And yeah, just, I'm not super optimistic about how various, you know, nations and governments are going to handle that. Um, and yeah, that that's, you know, one of the things that, made me think about doing this interview right now is it seems like that's accelerating um, at a rate where that's going to be a very real political problem soon. And it's, you know, it's kind of um, fitting. It's raining right now where I am in Philadelphia, in part because there's a tropical storm hitting Long Island right now. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I think this is happening way faster than a lot of us realized. Um, and I'm excited to like, you know, have you on the team, first of all, have people that are thinking about these kinds of things already, um, you know, w here with C4SS. But I also, you know, as much as I wasn't expecting it, I love this answer, both because immigration is going to be a huge part of the problem, but also because IP, like it makes so much sense to me after you said it, that that's the real constraint. And, you know, not only in the sense of like access to information, but things like Monsanto straight up um, releasing proprietary seeds and, and shit like that, right? Yeah, don't, even, don't even get me started <laughs> on, on Monsanto and seed patents. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I won't make you dwell on, uh, on seed patents. Um, but I did, I did also, I noticed you're pretty optimistic um, about things, more so than I obviously am right now. Um, and so I'm kind of wondering, I've sometimes seen this kind of thing called solar punk. And I'm wondering, like, is that a way that you define yourself? Is that an appropriate term for the future you're describing? What, what does solar punk mean? I don't know. I'm, I'm probably not particularly punk. I mean, uh, I like a black hoodie as much as the next person, especially on a cold winter day in the sun where the dark fabric can help soak up some extra heat. 
but uh, I might be a little too polite to be a like a stereotypical punk. Um, <laughs> but seriously, I think I think solar punk as an aesthetic or a genre of art or fiction is really cool. And I'm interested in seeing more solar punk writing and art. So like, what's the solar punk aesthetic? I guess like plants growing on almost everything and photovoltaic panels or windows or solar hot water panels on pretty much everything else. Um, I think tidal punk is cool too, like harvesting like uh, waves and like the tides and that that sort of energy. Wind punk, geothermal punk, is that a thing? I don't know. I make you could make it a thing, right? You're gonna be the first uh, first. Uh, geopunk could be too many different things so you really do need the the whole word there yeah i, I don't know i'm not sure what that looks like exactly but um kind of hobbity maybe people living in more earth sheltered dwellings or harvesting even like the deeper geothermal energy of like you know volcanoes and stuff i don't know i don't know <laughs> I'm, I'm into it i mean a volcano would be very punk like that's that would, that would be pretty punk <laughs> The volcano punks you. But um, I think I think painting a positive vision of the future is really important for anarchists because any, anyone can see the dystopian future that we seem to be just hurtling headlong towards. And it's, it's so easy to fall into despair. Um, it's not that we shouldn't remain clear headed and realistic about the dangers and the problems. But as anarchists, we believe that a, a better world is possible. So however unlikely, however difficult it may be. So imagining glimpses of that better world, I think, is, is so critical for inspiring others, for motivating ourselves when things seem really bleak, and for finding common ground and discovering where current trends and developments can be pushed in a more liberatory direction. Mm. So, yeah, I'd like to see more exploration of like solar punk visions of the future, more optimistic sci fi. I'd like to write some sci fi along those lines myself someday. Oh, no, we'll see if I ever find the time and patience. Yeah, I mean, that would be great. And I also I think it's important as well to have these, you know, some idea of the positive future we're going towards, um, in part because it makes it easy not to fall into the traps that other ideologies i'm thinking you know authoritarian communism here fall into of like oh we have to do this because the only other option is misery right mm. i i think it's useful to have some sort of positive plan forward <laughs> um but yeah i mean i guess part of that plan is going to be technology um, and that's something, you know, I, you said you're a transhumanist as well. I know everyone at the center is very interested in a lot of, a lot of future tech. Um, so what, yeah, what are you interested in seeing in the future? Um, yeah, so maybe kind of a, a kind of solar punk tech that I would like to see, I think, and I think could be pretty helpful. I wish I had the technical expertise to help develop it myself. Maybe one of our listeners does. But I'll try to explain. It's um it's kind of related to this idea of legibility, right? So like James C. Scott talks about how historically non-state communities would resist the plunder and parasitism of states by keeping their productivity illegible to them. Like it's harder to know exactly how much root vegetables someone has because they're literally underground. So the per but maybe the person growing them, especially if they've done it for a long time, might have a better idea. So, but I think we can distinguish between vertical legibility, like the top down view that the state takes when it looks down upon its subjects, and then horizontal legibility. So, like how clear things are on a peer to peer basis, like between one another, the, the knowledge that's shared by a local community. Mm. Um, okay, so, so imagine like a badass permaculture community garden, like a food forest on the commons. So to the untrained eye, it might look pretty chaotic, even wild or, quote, natural. And I have some thoughts on that word, so maybe remind me of that in a bit. But, uh, okay, but basically, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but basically a, a forest garden might appear fairly illegible to someone who didn't know better. Like there might be some fruits or vegetables mixed in that they recognize as edible, but maybe a lot of other stuff that they don't know. And it's not really laid out in neat rows, so it's hard to tell what's what. Now, maybe the people who planted it and have been tending it for years have a pretty good idea and they can do their best to verbally share that information with people who are new but want to be helpful or at least not harmful in their interactions. 
but there's a cost associated with that teaching and knowledge sharing, right? And it can be pretty high if you've got like a lot of newer people all of a sudden and they all want to be helpful and like there's definitely stuff to do like harvest or weed or mulch or maybe plant seeds in areas that have been disturbed or where there's a gap in the canopy. So even though maybe you want more horizontal legibility, it's costly to get there. What if this like horizontal transfer of knowledge could be made way easier? And as long as we have states, it would be especially nice if making something horizontally legible didn't automatically make it vertically legible too. But that seems really hard. Maybe like good encryption and OPSEC. I don't know. That's not my, that's not my area of expertise. But anyway, so I'm imagining this technology, and it maybe already exists to some degree, but I don't know. It's like a, an open source, locally encrypted, geospatially located, three-dimensional map slash wiki that you can freely and dynamically edit. Something along the lines of like an augmented reality toolbox for community gardens and community spaces more broadly. So you can like look through these lenses and see things like sun and shade regimes, the names and uses and life cycles of plants just pop up when you look at them. And different modes can show you like topography, paths, plans for future changes, maintenance schedules, and you can make notes that are spatially located right in the site, like this seed was planted here, or this wild bug or bird was observed here at such and such time, and all kinds of useful information like that. And this could be for like designing and planning community spaces too. Like, like what if you could feel what it's like to stand inside like a like a SketchUp model of a proposed community structure? Like, what are the views out the windows going to be like? Where is the sun going to penetrate at different times of the day slash year? And then community members could dynamically offer feedback, and the design could more quickly spiral through like that feedback loop and become better and more useful at actually like meeting the needs and desires of the people that are going to be using it with less guesswork by like some top-down planning committee or architect. Um, and ideally all this knowledge can be like accumulated over time as the garden grows and changes over time and it becomes like intergenerational. And, and ideally it's all encrypted and stored locally and backed up in like a Faraday cage every so <laughs> often or something. Like, I don't, I don't know if that's exactly solar punk or not, but it's something I've wished for at various times. I've been working in various community gardens or projects over the years. And I think, you know, the map is not the territory, but good maps can still be really helpful. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I'm a fan of a good map. Um, and th- I mean, this sounds fascinating. And I, I feel like we're heading in that direction with everything else, right? Like, when we interact in stores or in other very capitalist spaces, there's already a lot of similar technology starting to happen. Not that it's interactive in the same way, right? Um, but I do feel like there's the same kind of, the, the, you know, the basics of 3D modeling and of, you know, wiki creation and all of that is is there already. It's just not really being applied to to these sorts of questions and these sorts of purposes yet. Yeah, so there's some listener out there that's going to like hear this and be like, oh, yeah, all that stuff exists. And they're just going to like integrate it and make it really available. Right. Right, guys. <laughs> <Y'all smile. laughs> yeah, please email us the Google Docs of permaculture when you make it. <laughs> um, yeah, so you mentioned you have uh, thoughts on the word nature. Um, let's let's dig into that, because that's something I think about a lot, you know, as a religious person, as a transhumanist, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, so yeah, what what are your thoughts on the word nature? Oh yeah, words, right? So tricky. Um, <laughs> I realize a lot of people get like warm, fuzzy feelings from the word nature, and like permaculture folks say things like permaculture is about working with rather than against nature, and like you know, observing and mimicking nature's patterns. And like, I get what people are trying to say usually when they say nature or natural. Um, And as a word, you know, it has really strong emotional connotations. So I don't expect people to like stop using it. But I personally try to avoid it when possible. And I try to be more specific instead. Because so anyway, like a, a pretty common definition of nature is something like, the material world and its phenomena, especially as surrounding humankind and existing independently of human activities. 
Um, so this idea of humans as not part of nature or somehow exempt from it or independent of it in some way is kind of built in to how the word nature is used to a certain degree. Mm. And I don't find that super helpful, generally speaking. Yeah, I don't know. well, and it, I feel like it sets up, right, it sets up a dichotomy between nature and civilization, right? And civilization is where we have technology mm. and knowledge and whatever. So, it, yeah, I, I like. Um, it makes sense to me that you would want to bring humanity back inside, both as like a more accurate view, but yeah, I, I can see that dichotomy as being really, really problematic. Yeah, and the, and the word like technology gets thrown around a lot too. Um, I mean, and it's often used, I think, somewhat narrowly for things like electronic gadgetry or like cars and factories, fancy stuff like that. Mm. But I think like a broader definition can be really enlightening. Um, so just techniques and processes that apply knowledge. Um, so and, and so with this like broader definition, we can see humans as not so unique in being technologically advanced, like we're just nature doing natural stuff. Um, and this kind of conceptual division between humanity and other life forms can dissolve a little bit. Because what are seeds and spores and their dispersal mechanisms, if not a technique or process? And like, doesn't a seed apply the knowledge or at least the genetic information inside of it to grow into a much larger and more complex organism? I don't know, maybe this is getting into the semantic weeds here, but I think seeds are some of the most amazing technologies we have available to us. I mean, they're basically self-replicating, adaptive slash recombinating, solar powered, water fueled, 3D printers that make everything from food to medicine to materials to fuel to breathable air. And they've been doing it for millions of years longer than humans have even existed. Anyway, seeds are just the fucking coolest thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, se seeds are amazing. And I have heard people refer to um, technology in this way. I'm trying to remember what the context was. But technology, I've heard people say, like, technologies of nature. Um, and I, I think that's great because one of the things that... You know, one of the most fundamental ideas in Austrian economics is the idea of tacit knowledge, right? This knowledge that we don't even know we have. Um, and I think that can apply really beautifully to, you know, the technological exploits of probably not conscious. I mean, now, I, now I'm getting a little into the, like, our seeds conscious. I'm starting to wonder. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can really see a case for understanding this as a form of tacit knowledge and using it to our advantage, right? Like we just made um, a, a massively more effective vaccine against COVID because we started to understand the technology of mRNA, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I'm, I'm impressed with seeds as well. Is that, is that your favorite, um, my, know, my te favorite te technology? technology? Yeah. Uh, maybe i think it might be it's right up there anyway <laughs> mm. so we've been talking up permaculture a lot and part of that is you know my own fascination um but in the in the piece uh you briefly mentioned that permaculture and i guess more the permaculture movement contains some problematic tendencies um so i'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that and yeah, the things you see as a problem. I get, we just talked about nature as being one of those, but I'm sure there's I'm sure there's more. <laughs> mm, oh, I mean, the use of the word nature that's the, that's the least of it. Um, I mean, the permaculture movement definitely has some problems. I mean, even the term ecology was coined by a fascist, apparently, basically a fascist, Ernst Haeckel. Um, interesting, fascinating. His like a lot of the work that he did, but he had some really horrendous views on racism and eugenics and shit and yeah so I, I didn't know he coined the term ecology i've i've looked at his um uh drawings of different species yeah i mean amazing work yeah um, yeah really beautiful and then you find out he was a fascist yeah and i mean so yeah he was basically held really fascist you know nationalist authoritarian views and yet also he didn't like quite line up with like the Nazi party. So his books were banned <laughs> by the Nazis. So, like, I don't know. It, 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 any, anyway, it doesn't mean that ecology isn't a useful idea and that we can't appropriate it and turn it towards liberatory ends. 
But I think there's probably always going to be some reactionary elements within eco or green circles and that we have to be aware of and actively like inoculate against. So we need like an ecological anti-fascism. We need a green anti-fascism. Mm. Um, and there's definitely some like cult of personality shit going on in certain permaculture circles, like misogyny and abuse. I like seeing patriarchs and and there's this all too common phenomenon of like eco feudalism where like some rich white guy owns the title of some land and under the guise of like permaculture experiments or demonstrations he basically extracts labor from well-meaning but maybe a little naive young permaculture enthusiasts and i mean this is not really unique to permaculture right like this is just straight up how capitalism and absentee land ownership works um so like woofing or interning on farms can be great, but sometimes it can be really terrible and exploitative too. But you gain experience and education. But again, this ties back into like intellectual property and the artificial scarcity forcibly maintained by state violence. So like this knowledge and this land, rather than being freely available and widely accessible, instead it's monopolized by a privileged few that then use that monopoly power to extract rents. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds a lot like the uh, nonprofit industrial complex problem where you get naive and well-meaning people, right, to do a bunch of free labor or at least uh, improperly compensated labor. Um, one one sort of solution I've seen, at least here in Philly, we have a park that was reclaimed by the neighborhood. Uh, the folks who lived in the neighborhood around it took it back from the city. Um, and they they actually blockaded it. They stopped bulldozers from coming in for like a good year. Um, but they have started some permaculture projects up there. Um, and it's really just got me thinking about like access to land and like seizing land. <laughs> um, and I know that's very difficult, but yeah, I, I can very much see the problem with current land ownership and how it interacts with uh, with permaculture. Yeah, I mean that project sounds really rad. You say that's that's happening in Philly? Yeah, yeah. It's um they call it the Philadelphia Peace Park. Cool. Yeah, and it's, you know, people just taking control of their own environment again. Um but, you know, I guess in talking about land, um one of the answers that you get from writer libertarians, right, or folks on the right um about this kind of thing is that you know, we have to manage land in a certain way because it's scarce. Um, and this scarcity is something I think about a lot. I think probably most market anarchists think about a lot because as I understand it, the main difference between a market anarchist and a communist, at, at least in terms of economics, is whether we think scarcity is a natural, or maybe I shouldn't use the word natural, but we think scarcity is like an inescapable part of the universe, right? Whereas communists at least some in my experience don't, right? They think we can escape scarcity somehow. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm wondering your thoughts on how scarcity plays into all of this and what a post-capitalist future might reasonably look like, right? I mean, yeah, human desire is potentially infinite, right? Like, while there's enough for everyone to have plenty of clean air, water, food, and comfortable shelter, we want more, we're going to want more, and that doesn't have to be a bad thing. But I just think it makes sense to start by aiming for relative post-scarcity for those kind of basic things like right away. Because if everyone had free and direct access to air, water, food, shelter, if everyone was free from having to work under a boss just to meet their basic needs, imagine how free they would be to create, invent, imagine, and explore like ever more inspiring scientific discoveries, ever more like wonderful and euphoric forms of art. And like how free we could be to work on those longer term problems, like improving quality and length of life, figuring out how to like sustainably expand into space, like get at least some of our literal and metaphorical eggs out of this one fragile basket, this like one lonely biosphere at the bottom of a gravity well within whose void bounded walls exist every form of life we know about with any certainty. Mm. I mean, I think we have a responsibility to make it a long-term priority to expand life to the otherwise lifeless parts of our universe. I mean, how are we supposed to have a permanent culture like permaculturists say that they want if we're confined to just one decidedly impermanent and fragile planet? 
I mean, there's also always the heat death of the universe to think about too, but I guess we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. <laughs> yeah, we, we have, I hope, a very long time to work on that problem. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I love this, uh, this perspective of having not only a desire, but a responsibility to get off this planet, to do something with life, right? And not life in the sense of like our own individual lives, but like life existing in the universe, you know? Yeah. And that just diversity, those millions of species that, that exist as far as we know, only on this one rock, this one, like this one rock that could be hit by a, a planet destroying asteroid. And we might not even know that it's coming or that eventually the sun's going to expand and burn it all up. So it's like, it seems a shame to just, you know, focus entirely on, oh, how can we keep this sweet gig going? Like, yeah, we need to keep this going. We need to not fuck this up because it works pretty good. But also we need to figure out how to make closed ecosystems other than this one and make them sustainable on in the, in the really harsh environment of space. And whether that's, you know, asteroids spinning them up or like I'm maybe a little less optimistic about like terraforming planets, but at least they have gravity that we can work with. I don't know. There's, it's a super tricky problem. And, and I wish that we could spend more time trying to figure that out instead of all this, you know, terrible wars and wasteful everything. I, I don't know. Right. Instead of running around killing each other and putting each other in cages and all of that nonsense. Um, yeah, and I, I guess in thinking about scarcity, that's that's interesting because I often I often tell people that the most fundamental scarcity is time, right? Like, there's mm. only so many hours in a day that anyone can get anything done with any amount of resources. Um, but I also like the way in which this kind of I don't know. I feel like it kind of sidesteps the communist argument, right? Because all they're really aiming for is something like post scarcity on Earth. And you're saying even that's not post scarcity because the planet that is a one, you know, we have one planet. Like that is a scarcity too. Mm. Um, yeah. And I guess I'm just also thinking about uh, what you said earlier about the most fundamental resource being our imagination, our ability to interact with resources in new ways. Um, because that, you know, that is how I often explain the fact that scarcity existing doesn't mean we will always want, you know? Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, we've just got one planet. There's no planet B <laughs> yet. Yeah, yeah, yet. <laughs> and I, I guess in thinking about the uniqueness of this planet, right, and all of the life that lives on it, um, I get I get the impression that you think the freedom and well-being of non-human lives is important as well. So I'm wondering if you can say a little bit about that um, and whether, you know, as anarchists, concern for non-human lives should be a big part of our thinking. Um, yeah. So, I mean, just as we humans have ongoing projects and we work towards goals, and we'd like to not have our projects interfered with, so do our non-human fellow Earthlings. So just as anarchism aims to promote harmony and cooperation between humans, even as we pursue our diverse interests, it makes sense to me, at least, that we would also seek harmony and cooperation between us and non-humans, too, at least to a much greater degree than presently. Um, because just because their consciousnesses are so very different from ours and we can't understand or communicate with, excuse me, with them nearly as easily doesn't mean that their freedom is unimportant. I mean, freedom is key to flourishing, both for humans and non-humans alike. And the freedom of all is my freedom. Um, and so one idea within permaculture is that everything gardens, that is, everything interacts with and shapes its surrounding environment. And I think as humans, we can do a much better job of allowing other beings the space and time to garden alongside us. We can become better at observing these non-human patterns and processes and giving them more opportunities to grow and freely develop. Um, and I think this 
This could be a great segue into how this relates to like transhumanist anarchism or anarchist transhumanism, because if if we value the freedom to shape and transform our mind body environment interfaces, then we should value biodiversity as an expression of that morphological freedom in practice. Mm. Inter- interesting. Okay, so wh- I guess what exactly do you mean by morphological freedom? Can you explain a little bit what that term means? Um, yeah, I, I guess I mean it pretty literally. Like, um, if we value the freedom to change ourselves, we should value beings that are different from ourselves as basically a living expression of that freedom to change. Um, so it seems to me like one way we can measure or gauge how much morphological freedom there is in a system is to look at how much diversity of morph- of morphology there is. So valuing something like species richness, like a wider variety of different plants, animals, fungi species, seems to me at least to basically fall out of a desire for morphological freedom. Mm. Yeah, I, I guess that makes sense in the way that like having... It's it's just more options, right? And it, it kind of reminds me of the debate between Will Gillis and Aurora Apolito, where, you know, I think the one thing that Aurora really landed on and got right about anarchism, took from anarchism to try and rebuild um, a type of communism, was that our goal should be increased complexity. Um, and she makes, you know, the point that this is not basic superficial complexity it's not just more stuff right it's it's um you know this kind of complexity like biodiversity right is a form of complexity definitely and i I think even from like a even like a very narrow like anthropocentric uh, perspective you, you still really want there to be a lot of different forms of life because so many of the like things that we invent um, so many of our designs are basically utilize this kind of biomimicry of like, you know, the the wings of an airplane or like the there's like so many things. I don't I don't know. I, I, I don't have any good immediate examples, but a, a lot of a lot of the things that we come up with, the technologies that we come up with are basically like copying something some 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 animal or plant or fungus does like a way that they solve this particular problem so having that really having that library of information available is seems really useful even if you're like purely like selfishly like speciesist only care about humans like even then you you don't want to like lose the rich diversity of all the plants in in the amazon some of which might have be medicines for like some disease and we just don't even know yet. I mean, even if you're really super focused on just humans, you still, you still want to value uh, biodiversity, I would say. Mm. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I, I know we've talked about this before in relation to um, how different plants all support each other and different plants and fungi and how, you know, I, I, I'm always fascinated by the concept of what are they called? My, mycorrhizal networks? Is that how it's pronounced? Yeah, mycorrhizal networks. Myco, like myco, yeah. and then rhizal, like roots. <laughs> yeah, mycorrhizal networks. Um, and that's something that, you know, market anarchists have really latched onto and used sort of as an analogy for our belief system is that it's, you know, it's rhizomatic. Um, and so I'm I'm wondering what. What are your thoughts on how we can be more rhizomatic in our actions? How can we be more like fungi? Oh, I, I like this question. Okay, so um, if we want to be more like fungus, we can start by observing fungus. So like what it does, how it grows. So there are like the showy above the surface, like ruptures, the mushrooms, you know, those fruiting bodies. And they're beautiful and full of potential to affect minds and bodies to be potentially delicious, to be potentially deadly. Um, And then there's the dispersion of spores, right, spreading out and traveling potentially vast distances. But most of the time, the longest part of the life cycle of fungi is forming and growing and branching these mycelial networks. So these webs of connectivity below the surface, linking up like the roots of plants, 
sharing water, nutrients, resources, information. Um, so let's see ways we could be more like fungi. We could make allies with plants and practice more mutual aid. We can build stronger and more resilient networks. Um, and, and I want to go back a little bit um, to the subject of economics, because I think there are some interesting parallels between free market economics and like a permaculture approach to ecology and human habitat integration. So there's the, a shared emphasis on limiting like top down intervention, like economists can recognize how government extraction and enforcement can cause considerable harm, even when there might ostensibly be good intentions. And like a similar observation can be made in the context of ecology and agriculture about the health of soil food webs. So like extensively tilling up the ground or spraying poisons or trying to grow vast swaths of a single species in a monoculture is going to negatively impact the long term health of that system and lead to unintended consequences and more costs in the long run. Just like, say, things the state does, like policing, war and the creation and maintenance of monopolies. So like destroying these like underground networks of, of fungus and disturbing all the, all those like actively working systems is going to lead to these unintended consequences. Um, and I think to, to challenge and ultimately replace these harmful institutions, both things like the state and things like monoculture, um, <laughs> We need positive and practical visions of like better and healthier alternatives. So we need to build polycentric systems and counter economic networks. And we need to grow productive gardens that are diverse polycultures, like many different plant species. Mm. Yeah, no, and I, I see the similarity between, you know, what we talk about in economics and the the problem of the state coming in and it, sort of creating a monoculture in, in the market, right? Of all corporations need to look like this and are vast and um, don't have the same resilience and knowledge containment as smaller setups would. Um, so yeah, that, that's all very interesting. And I, you know, I see a lot of similarities here between ecology and the economics that we practice. Um, so with all of that said, I, I, oh, do you have anything more you want to say about ecology, economics, all of that? Oh, not that I can think of at the, at the moment. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I, I wanted to turn next to, you know, some of the current news. Part of the part of the impetus for doing this interview now is the recent climate change report um, coming out of the UN. And it was it was dismal. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted to ask what you thought of that and, you know, anything, uh, anything to keep us more optimistic. Oh, geez. I mean, yeah, I looked into that, uh, that report a little bit and it does seem like pretty bad news. Um, and I don't know whether some kind of like massive coordinated reduction in fossil fuel burning is going to happen to like mitigate the worst of the possible effects, but it, doesn't seem super likely to me, unfortunately. But um, I mean, you know, we can each do our little part, but, but like holding the worst and most entrenched polluters accountable is a really massive collective action problem, and it, it seems it seems really tricky to me. Uh, so I certainly don't have any great solutions for that. Um, and I think, unfortunately, the most effective response we can have as individuals is going to be to try to adapt and help others adapt as best we can. Um, I think we still have the opportunity and the potential to build and grow sustainable local ecosystems that can be resilient in the face of these changing conditions. And we can still work on developing and generating ecological infrastructure locally and work on gradually expanding it to be increasingly universal. I mean, as individuals, our ability to affect the global climate is so limited. But on the other hand, making changes to our immediately surrounding microclimates is very much within our grasp. Um, and, and the more we can develop and transform our physical spaces into habitable environments, not just for us humans, but for a wider diversity of life, especially plants, the more we can meet our own needs directly the less we're forced to interact with and contribute to harmful and polluting systems, 
then I think the better chances we'll have of actually growing strong enough networks to eventually coordinate more effective action on like a wider, more global scale. Mm. Yeah, that that makes sense. And I'm I'm now wondering, do you think it's a mistake to focus so much on climate change specifically, right? The big thing that requires global coordinated action, you know, rather than stuff like planting, you know, planting native crops and all of that. Um, I'm not I'm not sure whether it's a mistake or not. I, I think it could be interesting to kind of uh, take a step back and kind of reframe it as or or kind of think about what 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 does it mean to change the climate? Like what are the ways that we can that we can change climates in in positive directions and how can we change our microclimates? Um, how can we yeah, yeah, how can we change our microclimates? That seems a way to maybe reframe it more positively. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, I guess you kind of answered that. You stepped it back by saying, like, yeah, we need to address climate change, but the way we do that is meeting our needs directly so we don't have to interact with big global supply chains. I mean, there's so many pieces. And and like I say, the biggest, like, most entrenched polluters are not, you know, they're not just going to, like, stop just because you or I, like, stop supporting them. I mean, there's some huge... It's going to take some really massive collective action. And I, I don't know how I don't honestly, I don't know how we get there. Yeah. I mean, isn't isn't one of the biggest polluters, the um, U.S. military. Right. Exactly. Like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's a bit of a of a tall order. Um, all right. Well, even if we're not going to defeat the U.S. military anytime soon, I kind of want to end this on a more optimistic note. Um, so any, anything to help us stay optimistic here? Oh, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I know many problems are not currently within our reach or our grasp to be able to solve, but I don't think despair is going to help us solve the problems that we can reach. I think we need hope. Um, we need visions of the better worlds that are possible. And I'm not sure if I actually am optimistic, but I would like to be, um, as long as it's not like a blind, like naive optimism, because I think things could be better. And I think it's worth my time to try to make them better, even if it's just by a little bit. Well, thanks. And yeah, that's as long as we can imagine, like we can't convince anybody to help us work towards a better world if we can't imagine it ourselves. Right. Like that's that's not fair to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so usually um, Zach at the end always asks this question about books the most important or influential book that you've read on the subject of our interview so I'm going to ask that I'm going to keep doing it in um, Zach's absence what is the most important or influential book that you've read on this subject oh gosh I don't know if I can narrow it down um, but I guess books I would recommend Maybe start with like uh, Introduction to Permaculture by Bill Mollison. Maybe like Gaia's Garden by Toby Hemingway. Um, so really good like introductory permaculture texts. Um, Edible Forest Gardens. I think Eric Tonsmeyer, really great too. Um, a Permaculture Designer's Manual, um, also by Bill Mollison. That's great. Super comprehensive, classic in the text. And you know, pretty much instead of you know, Google Murray book chin, which is like a meme, right? I'm going to go with like, <laughs> like just duck, duck, go Bill Mollison. Okay. <laughs> like, right. you're ch- I mean, you're changing the whole culture. We're going to duck, duck, go Bill Mollison. We're not talking UBI. It's UEI. Like, <laughs> and, and yeah, just um, more broadly, since Zach also usually asks about like um, interpretive dance recommendations. Um, oh yeah. I'm just, <laughs> That's <laughs> right. I'm going to, I'm going to just recommend you just take some time to go outside and observe the plants growing in your local area. Cause like, have you ever seen like time-lapse videos of plants growing? I mean, it's definitely a kind of dance in really slow motion. So yeah, just like go outside, watch what the plants are doing, look for patterns. 
You don't have to identify all the plants, but you could. There's some like pretty good apps for that these days. Um, but maybe take like a little mental inventory of like the different kinds of plants in your area and like what their general strategies seem to be. Like, what are they doing? What, why is their morphology the way that it is? What are they trying to accomplish? Um, I think we can learn a lot from plants. Hmm. Yeah, well, I'm going to definitely pay a lot more attention to the plants and animals in my life. Um, and I think, you know, we're coming up on time here. So we're going to end the interview here and i guess evan thank you so much for being on um i'll just give you you know one more uh chance here if there's anything else you want to say to the listeners anything you want to plug uh before we close it out oh i mean just thanks so much alex for having me on um i'm just yeah i don't know i don't know what else to say (laughs) thank you Awesome. Well, thank you, Evan. Um, It was great to have you on. And a big thanks to all of our listeners and supporters. If you're not already a supporter on Patreon, uh, you can check it out. We've recently updated our Patreon tiers, and we've added a whole bunch of swag for supporters. It's mostly books, so if you want some books, uh, you can find us at www.patreon.com slash c4ss.org. And as always, that's patreon.com slash C4SSEOTORG. We really, you know, couldn't do any of this without you, and we appreciate the support on Patreon every day. So I want to give a special thanks, a special thanks to our producer level supporters, who are Danny O'Brien and David Colborn, to our co producer level sponsor, who is ASDFASDF. And to our associate producer level sponsors, Derek W., Humanosphere, and James Puddle. Goodbye.